So now, the Buddha continued. So all these demons and ghosts, even the kings of demons, you know, powerful in heaven, they are still imprisoned by this worldly passion and possessiveness. Why you are in Samadhi, you enjoy uh, connecting with the Buddha power, with your own Buddha nature inside, and you enjoy and you pure, you uplift it. Therefore, they cannot affect you any more than a blowing wind can affect light, or as if a knife cannot cut through water. Ah, just like what I told you now, okay? When you remember you are Buddha, nothing can harm you, okay? Remember that? It's the same, Buddha likened these uh, demons, even though they're full of hatred and power, but they cannot do anything to you if you are truly connected with the Buddha power, yeah? If you're truly sincere when you meditate. Mm. Because if they want to harm you, it's like a knife cut through the water, nothing happened to the water, yeah? You must be strong, must be convinced, and remember the Buddha say that you have Buddha nature exactly like Buddha. Believe that, and believe that you are God-like. At least you are children of God. Even you can't believe that you're one with God, but you're from God. Who created you if it's not from God? The devil? Of course not, you don't look like. <laughs> the tree creates you? No, <laughs> you don't look like. Huh? You look like the image of God that you think God would look like. That is what it is. If God appeared to you, it's just like you, similar to your face. Understand? Just more glory, more light, because we are confined in this body, so we don't see our glory. Mm. So you are like boiling water, the Buddha continued to comfort and reassure his disciples. You are like boiling water, while the demons are like solid ice, which, in the presence of heat, soon melts away. <laughs> Imagine you put a piece of ice cube into the boiling water, what happened? Gone. Gone. You are like boiling water. They are just like ice, ice cube. <laughs> Uh, they are furious. Of course, they want to destroy you. They want to disturb you, but they can't. Mm? Even if they do, it's just temporarily. Don't fear, okay? Don't worry about it. It will be gone. And they even disturb me all the time. Whenever I want to meditate, of course, not for me. Huh? Uh, I never say, okay, I'm going to do a retreat now so that I be more powerful, I become this, I have all this more power. No, no, no. Every time I do retreat, it's for some purpose. It's for for the world, you know, either for this or for that. Everything just benefit for the world. And they even more scared. <laughs> yes, they're more scared. Because if more people enlighten, the world have peace, then they, they cannot have any more power to control over people, to make them do bad things, to fight with each other, to destroy each other, or to be degrading their own Buddha nature. Oh, that's why they're scared. Since they rely exclusively on spiritual powers, they are like mere guests. Yeah. Let me read more. They can succeed in their destructiveness through your mind. You see, only. Yeah. Which is the host of the five skandhas. You know, the feeling, the touching, emotion, stuff like that. On your mind, uh, the master of all this, <laughs> your mind wants you to have this, your mind directs you to have that, even though it's not good. Yeah. So everything is created by the mind. If the host becomes confused, the guests will be able to do as they please. Yes. So your mind, if not stable, if it's not in the right concept, in the right stationary status of, of purpose, of enlightening, then they, the guests can maneuver and make trouble. When you are in dhyana, I mean, in meditation, awaken, the Buddha say, awake, aware, and free of delusion. Their demonic deeds can do nothing to you. It's like that, yeah, just like above. As the skandhas dissolved, all this kind of sensation, feeling, or emotion, uh, you left behind then, okay? You study in samadhi, recite the five names. Think of God, think of your Buddha power, inner master power. Then all the feeling or whatever 
a desire you have or thinking you have will be gone. Mm? You will enter the light then. Mm. All those deviant hordes depend upon dark energy. Yes. Since light can destroy darkness, they would be destroyed if they drew near you. Because if you're steady in your purpose and pure in the mind while you're meditating, they cannot go near. Yeah? I saw you before. Remember, you are the Buddha. Same. Okay, huh? Then they will not be able to go even near. They can try, but they, after a while, they cannot go near if you're steady. How could they dare linger and try to disrupt your Diana Samadhi? Yeah, I told you the same. I would probably be in retreat without this uh, initial disturbance if I don't have to carry so much work every day. You understand? Therefore, the first day of my retreat, they can disturb. But there was only the first one or two. <laughs> now they don't. <laughs> they, they're nowhere. <laughs> nowhere to see anymore. Just the first one or two. Hmm? When I first meditate for something big, and they're scared, they want to disturb me, but they know they're not successful, so now they cannot go near even. Understand me? Huh? Don't fear. Mm. But if you were not clear and aware, and if you were confused by the skandhas, then you, Ananda, would surely become one of the demons. You would turn into a demonic being yourself. Keep your mind straight, decide the five names all the time when you meditate. Eh? No desire anything. No thinking of even desiring anything. No one to be quickly enlightened, no one to have rich and fame, and no one to be oh, famous, a master, become a master, even nothing. Just want liberation. Want to know your Buddha nature. Okay? Want to be Buddha then, can do. Okay? Of course. Want to know your nature and want to be a Buddha is not a desire. It's a self-inherent birthright. And it is a duty even, an obligation, yeah? What we are born for, that we can seek our own Buddha nature, that we have a chance to be enlightened and to become the master of ourselves again, okay? So it's not a desire. Because when you become a Buddha, you benefit others. This is very selfless, very noble. Hmm? At least you liberate yourself and you don't be slave for any lowly desire or scandals anymore, but you're free, noble, light, beautiful, huh? <laughs> beneficial. So the Buddha continued, your encounter with Mataji's daughter. <laughs> Buddha don't forget that, does he? <laughs> he continued to talk to Ananda about the you know, the love, love a girl that chased him. Mm. Was a minor incident. She cast a spell on you to make you break the Buddha's moral precepts. Still, among the 80,000 modes of conduct, you violated only one precept. Because your mind was pure, all was not lost. You broke only one precept. He did not really. He just was, I would say, seduced. And, and he was not powerful enough. He did not prepare for that. Yeah? Not only because he's beautiful, but he wasn't prepared that he's, he's going to be seduced. Yeah? He did not know that. And he did not uh, know the mantra at that time to counter that kind of most powerful mantra in the three world. So the Buddha said you broke only one precept. Violate only one precept. That means maybe nearness bodily to a woman. Almost gone to back to the normal, like a level of man and woman desiring and having physical pleasure. No, that almost gone. So the monk normally should not touch any woman. He violate only that. But unwillingly, it was not his fault. Yeah, it was not his fault. He was like uh, bewitched into doing that. And at least he was so pure that he still can remember the Buddha. No one, no one except Ananda or a monk of his kind of status would ever be able to escape this kind of mantra. Yeah, so uh, 
talking about ananda, anyone could fall into this kind of situation. Huh? If you're not strong enough, you fall, okay? Because you can't use magical power to defeat these kind of people, yeah? Mm. You just stay awake, aware, and run. <laughs> That's the best. The Buddha continued to say, uh, all was not lost, eh? He comforted Ananda. He just make an example for him to know how he could escape such a powerful mantra. Yeah, because he was pure. Now, so Buddha continued, this would be an attempt to completely destroy your precious enlightenment. Whew. Were it to succeed, you would become like the family of the senior government official who is suddenly exiled. His family wanders bereft and alone with no one to pity or rescue them. If Ananda has succumbed to this uh, magic power and sensational uh, bodily desire and contact, then he would be lost. Just like suddenly you are fired from your official court position and exiled somewhere and depriving <laughs> of being with your family and whatever you love. In those days when one of the official offended the king, then they excite him somewhere and his family is scattered anywhere else. Or even maybe being chop chop. Mm. So, Ananda, you should know that as a cultivator sits in the Bodhi Manda, in, in his uh, place of meditation, yeah, as we talked yesterday, mm. Or any any place that you chose to make it into your place of meditation, your quiet corner, yeah? Be it your attic, your basement, your car, <laughs> your mobile home, or your tent. That's your body manda, where you sit with determination to find your true self nature. Mm? So, uh, you should know that a cultivator sits in bo a body manda. He is doing away with all thoughts. If you can, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> when his thoughts come to an end, there will be nothing on his mind. This state of pure clarity will stay the same whether in movement or stillness, in remembrance or forgetfulness. This is easier for the monks in those times. They have no possession whatsoever. They just have a robe, a bow, and maybe a blanket to sleep. <laughs> Understand, yeah? And they just went out to, to bake for food. If they have food, they eat. If they don't have, okay, they stay for another day. But mostly they would have, because the Buddha has become so famous, the people even come to make offering. There will be always some food in the store, and they're allowed to keep something essential for seven days, yeah, each month. Yeah. Depends on what they need. Buddha continued. When he dwells in this place and enters samadhi, he is like a person with clear vision who finds himself in total darkness. Although his nature is wonderfully pure, his mind is still not yet illuminated. This is the region of the form of skanda. Even though he sits in samadhi very well, he is still not yet completely out of the skandhas. I mean, when you have some thought, feeling, emotional, mentally, your thought, your emotion, your design, form something in your mind. And that is still a form from feeling, a form mundane, a skanda, a feeling, a sensation. It's not the real Buddha's land, okay? So the Buddha warned you like that. If his eyes become clear, he will then experience the ten directions as an open expanse. You see visions, yeah, from the ten directions. And the darkness will be gone. The Buddha described the inside experience. Darkness will be gone. This is then the end of the form skanda, meaning if you, uh, your wisdom eyes clear already, then you can see real uh, vision of different heavens in the ten direction, or maybe Buddha's lands, 
At that time, then, the so-called skanda form that you have created before with your desire, your thought, your uh, emotion, mental, imagine, etc., destroy. Because the real thing come already, okay? He will then be able to transcend the turbidity of kalpas, contemplating the cause of the form skanda one sees that false thoughts of solidity are its source. Ha! Huh. Yeah, I was right. Uh, the Buddha say, if you've seen the ten clear universe, ten direction vision or Buddha's land, then you will destroy this uh, desire form. Yeah, and then he, the the cultivator, the meditator, will see the true cause of this uh, false uh, scenery that he has formed in his mind. They are just false thoughts or desire that's, you know, uh, solidify itself into like vision. Yeah, but it's not real. Okay, no, I'm going to, <laughs> I'm going to read further one more paragraph, and then you can go rest. Yeah, because <laughs> we are coming to the first demon, okay? <laughs> At least, and then other demons we will <laughs> introduce <laughs> as the day uh, come. Ananda, at this point, as the person intensely investigates that wondrous brightness, okay, he already clear his vision and it's a real vision coming already. At this point, the four elements will no longer function together and soon the body will be able to transcend obstructions. You will not feel anything anymore at that time. You don't even feel you have a body, okay? then you're okay, yeah. But this state is called a, the pure brightness merging into the environment. It is a temporary state in the course of cultivation and does not indicate sagehood. Even then, not yet. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, you still want to practice? Sounds very hard. <laughs> okay. If he does not think, it's okay not to worry. As long as you realize it's, it's just a state, okay? It's not yet sainthood. It's not a complete enlightenment. Just one little step, as long as you humble enough to recognize that. Then not to worry. See, Buddha say, If he does not think he has become a sage, then this will be a good state. No harm done. Good. One step to go up. But if he considers himself a sage, then he will be vulnerable to the demon's influence. Yeah. So whenever some of your brother or sister tell me he is already in such and such, I say, forget that. <laughs> Don't ever think like that. <laughs> because you will not realize you are sage. Only you see something and you feel, wow, so much vision, so much light. It's not it yet. Just a step of this staircase. Huh? Even I told you, you see the master come to your house, talk to you, teach you. It's still, it's just kind of halfway maybe. Okay? It's nothing yet. Okay. So, um, oh, he just keeps saying demons influence, but he has not come to... What kind of demons yet? Oh, it's still a lot. Uh, first, the Buddha uh, described the stage of your being in which you could fall into the demon's influence. And later, in other pages afterward here, he will tell you, he will point the name of the special demons, which one doing what and why and where from. You understand? And how to prevent Whew, you want to read all that? Yes. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh. There are ten states of samadhi. 
even you are in a clear vision, pureness, seeing light, vision, and all that, all it, you still, within the 10 states, you will still fall into the demonic influence if you are not aware. Okay, so that state that the Buddha just described is only the first one. <laughs> there are nine more, and knowing me, knowing you, it will be many hours <laughs> until the ten stage is finished. Uh, I would like to do it tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, yes. We should really thank the past masters, monks, and nuns, and scholars who have take time to record the Buddha's teaching after the Master's Nirvana. And also for the past and present persons, lay or monks or nuns who have really dedicated themselves, sacrificed their time and precious health or under any difficult situation to translate this so that I can read it to you. And we have to thank them. And may they be blessed forever by all the Buddhas, past, present, and future. May their merit be immense. May they be liberated forever. Thank you. Because I also need to be in state of sound uh, clearness in order to impart that clearness to you. Even though just reading the sutra is uh, taxing some intellectual or mental soundness, okay? I don't want to force myself to do it when I'm not in perfect state of clear understanding, okay? Uh, I could interpret it wrong. I wanted to do it right tomorrow, okay? Yeah. Even good things can't eat too much. <laughs> right, okay. Um, I still live for some, some time, <laughs> so we can do that, huh?